dreams he is the captain ain't nobody dope as me i'm just so fresh and so fresh and so clean clean thank you thank you thank you it's good to be seen and it's good to see you thanks for listening thanks for telling a friend We are drinking Dark Cloud by Mother Earth Brewing in North Carolina. Garage grade three and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a Munich style Dunkel lager. This beer is aged three times longer than most beers, but don't let the dark color fool you. Dark Cloud is not heavy and it's not bitter. And it was brought to us by, first up, we have our good friend, Mr. Joe Bacon in Irving, Texas. Bacon. And also a big thanks to Scott from the Piney Woods of East Texas. And a big shout out to Janice S. Old Chandler Bing from Parts Unknown. Also in Parts Unknown, we have Pamela. And a big shout out to Kenton in Wald Lake, Michigan. And a cheers to Carrie in Bloomington, Indiana. And last but not least, a shout out to Catherine in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thanks to everybody for helping us out with this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And we're definitely months and months behind, so be patient, my friends. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On the night of December 20th, 2015, Sean Patrick McDuffie Jr., along with his quote-unquote friend Eric Brown left Calhoun, Georgia. They were on their way to Clay County, North Carolina to drop off Eric. Well, they're successful in doing so. And Sean Patrick McDuffie Jr. is making his way back home to Calhoun, Georgia. Now, he is spotted twice on his way home. And this is on December 21st, the following day. He spotted two times on surveillance cameras, first at a Walmart store and then second at a Car City gas station that is located in Franklin, North Carolina. Both of these sightings, according to what was observed on the surveillance footage, Sean appeared to be alone at this time. Shortly after leaving the gas station, he called his then-girlfriend or ex-wife. We're a little confused on the relationship, but the woman he lived with, he called her on his cell phone explaining that he was confused and lost. He did not know where he was going. He did not know what road he was on. But more importantly, he told her, please tell my children that I love them because I think that I'm being followed. Shortly afterwards, he loses cell phone service. And then for the next several days, his Brandy King and his mother and his sister, Megan, they search for Sean. They see no trace of him. They never hear from him after sending him messages, calling him, never hearing from Sean Jr. On December 30th, just four days after he was reported missing, and now nine days after anyone had spoke to Sean, his rental truck was found. The vehicle was located by a private citizen sitting in the middle of Bernard Creek Road, which is located within the Natahala National Forest. This is a gravel one-lane road that dead ends. The road turns off of U.S. Highway 64 West in Clay County, North Carolina. Now, we believe that Sean was traveling on that road according to what we could see on the surveillance footage at the gas station. During this time of year, when it was located, this road was seldom used other, other than by a hunter every so often. So it's really not surprising that it was not located, that the truck was not located until several days after Sean was reported missing. As to the contents of the vehicle, well, one investigator states that it almost appeared as though Sean was living out of the vehicle. There were several bags of clothes and shoes along with with several personal items, such as a calendar, a day planner, and various receipts, including the one from the Walmart and various other small items. In the bed of the pickup truck, there was only a fishing pole, a car jack, and some loose garbage. The only significance as to the location where the truck was eventually located and found is the fact that it turns off of U.S. Highway 64 West. Now, the plastic case for the holster or for one of the holsters that Sean had purchased at the Walmart 
This was located inside the vehicle. However, based off of receipts found in the truck and from video footage, there are some known missing items from the truck. This includes the holster itself, a knife, a toboggan, some ammo, and gun cleaning solvent, plus the cash he had on his person. None of these items have ever been recovered. Mm-hmm. Now, we should point out that it is believed that Sean had a large amount of cash on him when he was traveling back to his home. And we know this because the rumors are that they were, him and Eric were selling drugs the day before and possibly the morning of. And we also have the fact that we believe this to be about $1,700 in cash. Mm-hmm. And where we get this information from is apparently that's what how much money he had told Brandy King that he had on him when he was traveling back home. Mm -hmm. So maybe this was that big score that he was looking to get, or at least this was going to be some money to, you know, Brandy King wanted him to get out of the drug business, you know, to, to clean himself up and to get on the right path. Maybe that was Sean's intentions. We don't know. The troubling thing here is his vehicles found it's like five miles after that gas station. Right. He didn't make it very far from that gas station. Now or, there's, or he chose not to make it that far. <clears throat> yeah. But there's also some, there's some rumors and some stories out there that Sean may have actually made it all the way back to Calhoun and that the people responsible for his disappearance and ultimately his death mm-hmm. knew where he was coming from, knew about this trip and they decided to drop the truck off somewhere along the way to make it look like he never had made it back to Calhoun. They know that he's making this trip with Eric. They know that he's selling drugs. They know that he has some money. They know that he possibly has some more drugs. That Just because they sold drugs, we don't have any record, do we, of that all the drugs were sold, that he didn't have any drugs left. And meaning that you have now money and possibly more drugs as as a motive there. But so you're saying that, that these individuals followed him once they were able, they followed him all the way back to his hometown. Once he gets back in town, that's where they take him over, murder him. Then they take his truck and drive it all the way back to this midway point or a little more than midway. Well, the the way that the rumor was told to me is that potentially he made it all the way back to Calhoun, that these individuals didn't have to follow him. They were aware of this trip. All they then need to know is that he's, in fact, made it back to Calhoun. They intercept him there somehow. He's killed in Calhoun, and they take the truck back along this route that they know he would have traveled leaving the truck somewhere on this route, making it look like he never even made it back to Calhoun. All right, so then our major suspects in this theory would be Stephanie, um, Bigum, and Goforth. Well, yeah, and that's what's interesting about this case because there's no lack of suspects here when you talk about it. I mean, Mm -hmm. we have an individual, Sean Jr., that's, you know, he's involved in criminal activity, so he's hanging around with, bad elements, Mm -hmm. uh, some that might be worse elements than he is. And along the way, we, you know, we already said there's no real friends in this criminal ring. These are just associates and people that you are forced to have interaction with to make money. And these are not people that have one another's backs. These are people that would likely turn on each other at the drop of a dime. Mm -hmm. And so there's no shortage of enemies for this young man. So, yeah, it could be Stephanie, it could be Goforth, it could be Biggin, it could be all three involved together. Mm -hmm. But I think, just so we can be clear, I think let's go through these one at a time to kind of clean this up a bit, okay? The first thought, like you mentioned, would be that he simply parked his car, took the money that he made off of this, selling these drugs along the way to North Carolina, walked off, created a new life. That sounds great. And I hope, you know, I hope that Sean is alive somewhere. I wish that he would return and take care of his children. But regardless, there's no proof of any of that. There's no evidence to believe that that is what happened other than we're missing Sean. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to step aside from that theory. Then it, it, let's investigate all theories that do not involve foul play. Okay. The second theory would be that he committed suicide or that he was in some kind of meth induced hallucinaz- hallucination. Mm hmm. And remember, it is rumored that he was a, a drug addict or, or at least using drugs as well as dealing them. Mm-hmm. And this story has a strange, like, Brandon Lawson feel to it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Where you wow. have an individual who's driving somewhere, doesn't seem to know where he is. This situation, Sean Jr. thinks that he might even be be followed. Right. There was There was a rumor. Now, I just want to say straight up just rumor with Brandon Lawson that he he might have been doing meth, that he was a one-time meth uh, user, and he may have gone back to that. We don't know that to be the case. But, or that he was on some other kind of drug. Correct. But the speculation being that in a, in a fit, he's mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere driving his truck, he's using drugs, he decides to, he thinks something's going on that's not going on, he decides to abandon his truck, runs out of gas, whatever, and he gets lost somewhere out there and, and succumbs to the elements. Well, and what there is some some evidence, possibly, some speculative evidence, right? He mm-hmm. stops at the Walmart. He gets batteries for what we think is for a flashlight. I'm guessing it's one of those big, you know, you know where you get the D batteries or whatever. Like it, a mag light? Yeah, and then he stops to get a gun holster. Mm-hmm. Again, something you can get when you get back. Correct. Flashlight. Do you need it tonight? You can get the batteries when you get back. Right. It's almost like, well, I stopped at the Walmart. Now I'm going to stop at this gas station. I'm going to get directions. But what did he get directions for? Did he get directions for to get back home? Or was it, hey, is there any place I can fish around here? Or is there? Yeah, because he did have the fishing pole in that. Right. And just because there's one doesn't mean that he didn't have two in there to begin with. So all I'm saying is like the, the, the getting the batteries almost seems like the, it was intentional only to get them for some reason before he got back. It, well, that's, that, that's all I'm saying. So that gives us some evidence that maybe, hey, I'm going to go off into this woods after I'm after I made a bunch of money, going to do a little drugs, do a little fishing, mm-hmm. never seen from again. Well, and that's interesting. You bring up a very interesting point here because like we said yesterday, there's not a ton of information out there. Well, (laughs) that's not even a fair statement to say. There's no information out there on this case. This is an open case and they, they probably have collected a lot of evidence and information. They've just not released it because it's not necessary to do so. So where the story comes from that Sean Jr. stopped and one of the reasons for stopping at that gas station was to ask for directions. This comes from from Brandy King. Mm-hmm. We don't I've not seen anything or been told anything from somebody working at the gas station that that says in fact, yes, he did ask for directions. Mm-hmm. For all we know, maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't ask for directions. Or like you said, where did he ask directions to? What seemed to be his destination? Was he asking for directions back to Calhoun or well, some like other location. And like you said, he stopped off in an area that pretty pretty much only hunters would travel. At so, that time of year. Right. So was it, you know, just, hey, is there any place that I could see nature? You know, go on a hike? Yeah, I mean, who knows? I'm just saying that I think the batteries, getting the batteries before you head back is a sign of something. Mm-hmm. Well, Here's here's the thing. Yeah, and you're right. He picks up some strange items, makes some strange odd purchases, let's say. Um, it is wintertime. It is cold, so the toboggan I don't think is really an odd purchase. Yeah, the holsters, you could get those when you get back to town, unless he was eager, you know, unless he, like, oh, I've, I got a gun. I'm going to conceal it on myself. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or or did he feel like he was being followed before he stopped at the, the Walmart? you know, is, mm-hmm. is a, another thought as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then the being followed, was that just some kind of paranoia based off of the met using meth or, or mm-hmm. something else? And the, in some kind of hallucination, hallucination, 
he thinks he's being followed. He pulls off into this wooded area, into this rural area, parks the car and gets out trying to flee whatever he thinks he's getting away from and then succumbs to the elements at some point. It is winter time. Right. And he could have been hungry and tired when he exited the vehicle. So there's a couple issues with that situation with if he would were to have committed suicide or if he were to have parked the vehicle and succumbed to the element somewhere. The problem with that is what information I could find seems like the search for him in that area where his truck was found was extensive. Like it went on for days and they used every resource they had to look for this individual. They never turned up anything. Well, and you believe because we had so many items we do know there's so many items in the truck that these dog, you know, if they use um, scent dogs, they're going to pick up on this scent. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm assuming that they didn't, or if or whatever scent they did pick up on, led to a, a dead end. Well, and I also spoke with a firefighter and a gentleman that works in the park services. Okay, and mm-hmm. these are people that aren't necessarily. Um, the thing is, the reason why they're important is because of their backgrounds, the background, they have backgrounds in searching for people and searching areas such as this for people. Now, what both of them told me was with what they could see, what they could find of what was used and how the length of time that was involved in these searches for Sean, they thought that should have turned him up. And if that didn't turn him up, what they were even more surprised by was that when the next hunting season comes around, you know, when spring, when spring breaks and and people start returning to this area, they believe that Sean would have been found. His remains would have been stumbled upon by a hunter, a hiker, something of that nature. Now, keep in mind, we're two and a half years removed and he went, he went missing in late December. So we've now had two springs. We've had two hunting seasons and more in two summers that have passed and nobody has stumbled upon his remains. So making it look less and less and less likely that he succumbed to the elements out in this area where his truck was found. And we learned that one of the other rumors that is floating around town is that he, the destination that he, him and Eric were going to correct that he was killed there, but we kind of squashed that because we do have two sightings of him. Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of the, the, the first big rumor that came out when he went missing was that, you know, it's the short story of this guy goes up to some spot in North Carolina. He must've been killed there cause he was never seen again. And like you said, we have the two situations of the surveillance video footage of Sean jr on his route back to Calhoun. So we know he at least made it there to the destination, Mm -hmm. dropped off Eric. He had some interaction, according to rumors, with this Jericho character for which he traded guns for drugs. And money. And money. money. Drugs. Correct. Money and guns, yeah. All those fun things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) These are a few of my favorite things. And so any rumor that he was killed by this Jericho guy or even Eric Brown, who he was last seen with, I'm not saying it's impossible that neither of those guys had anything to do with him, but what makes it less likely is that we know that that Sean Jr. left safe and sound from that location. I don't think it changes anything as far as percentage-wise there, and and I'm sure this has been talked about, but... You drop an individual off. He's going to visit his family. This is a guy that claims that you stole money from him. Mm -hmm. Um, He is the main reason you're there, right? He's putting you in this situation. Eric, put you in this situation, right? Just follow follow me on this. I'm following you. So he was the main reason. Hey, I need to go see my family, but I need you to take me. But I'm going to make it worth your while because we're going to sell some drugs once we get up there. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. We'll make a little, little bit of cash. You're my friend, which I just accused you of stealing some money from me, $1,000. If this is a big payday, oh, man, wow, you know, uh, Sean Jr. gets his big payday of 1700 Well, then 
a thousand dollars going missing, that's a pretty big wad of cash. Right. So Eric then concocts this plan. Hey, I'm going to get you up. Take me to North Carolina. We make the drug dealer. Uh, we make the drug deal with Jericho. Mm -hmm. This guy probably has a faux hawk, right? <laughs> faux hawk confirmed. And what we do know, what we do have, again, is it evidence? I'm not. I'm not saying it's evidence, but it starts making a little more sense when you go. He's on the phone with his girlfriend, saying, "Hey, I think I'm being followed." To the point where he says, "Tell my children I love them." Right. Again, I believe that he, if he felt like he was being followed, whether he's in a drug state or not, whether it's paranoia or not, I think he felt that before. Uh, Walmart stops, gets batteries for the flashlight, gets the gun holder. Then he starts heading down to the gas station. Still thinks he's being followed. Stops to get directions. Is talking to his girlfriend. Says, "Hey, I'm being followed. Tell my kids I love them." The people that were following him could have been Eric or Jericho. Or both, I guess. Or both. And the thing, what I'm saying is, who puts you in this situation? Eric does. Right. So it's definitely an angle that needs to be looked at. And like I said, all I'm saying is, don't lessen the percentage of what you think their involvement is until we, we clear that path. Does it, make, does it make more? Here's the thing. If you get him up to North Carolina and you kill him there, now you got to get rid of the truck, but now he's not seen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, what a better thing. Like, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow him back. I'm going to wait for him to stop and get gas so he's seen by somebody. Then that's when I'm going to kill him. Mm -hmm. And But then he'll be seen by somebody else, which then will give me an alibi. And my alibi will be up in North Carolina, and the alibi is probably somebody in his family. For Jericho, though, if you're going to kill Sean and you're Jericho, mm -hmm. wouldn't you figure out a way to get the money to get the drugs rather than trading him potentially weapons that he could use to kill you for the drugs? Right. This is this would be getting speculative evidence against this point for Jericho mainly. Correct. But, but then if let's say this was it doesn't rule out Eric because Eric would have walked into that situation, not knowing, Hey, Jericho is going to trade guns. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, for this situation to work out for Jericho to be innocent, right? Then we're just saying, Hey, look, I've provided you some, some, some weapons that you could defend yourself with and, and, re and kill me. Right. If I'm trying to take you down, it seems unlikely that Jericho has any involvement where you have Eric who's along for the ride doing these drug deals as well. And he doesn't know that, that, uh, right. Sean's going to be offered some guns, <laughs> but imagine that situation. If you're Eric, you're like, shit, I was, I was going to kill this guy. And I'm now trying he's to kill this bastard. And now he's, now armed, he's got two guns armed and ready to go. And look, that's the other thing that I kind of wonder here. Like you think you're being followed. So you stop. This stop at Walmart is just odd to me. It would be different if you picked up, you know, some potato chips. And I mean, I don't know what was on that receipt. I don't think we know for sure what's on that receipt. If he's just picking up potato chips and so some of the items that. So as far as the receipt goes and for the purchases he made at Walmart, um, some of those items have been made public, not all it's my understanding, not all of them. And what's confusing about it is we have the purchase of the batteries and the, uh, at least one gun holster. Right. But remember we have a later report that says due to receipts found in the vehicle and things seen on surveillance footage, there were items that they thought they would find in the truck that were never recovered. Right. So we know that some of the items have been reported, but clearly not all of them. Yeah, and so, again, that's the tough thing about some of these cases. You go, to me, there's something there with the Walmart, the, the stop at Walmart. But, again, if you tell me on the list that there was a cup of Coke, you know, some Coca-Colas, there was a, a slice of pizza or something from, or a pretzel or something, you know, sometimes they have the pretzel shops in there or whatever. And if you tell me that, that's on the receipt too. And then by the way, why he's in there, he just bought some items. Right. Okay. No big deal. That stop doesn't seem as random, but you know, you, you go batteries and gun holder. 
I go, if you feel like you're being followed and you have this gun, why not get a holder? Why not get some batteries for your flashlight? And is it possible that at that second stop, that when he got back in the car and he lost signal, that he said, you know what, screw this. I'm just going to pull off 64 and whatever's following me, they're, they're going to stop or they're going to keep going. But if they stop, I'm I'm armed. Now, if they search the site a lot, you'd think that they would find some bullet casing, right? right? Um, now this is why it kind of leads me back to a possible Jericho or a possible Eric, because what if he pulls off? The person pulls in, his gun is drawn, and then he realizes I know this person. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's, I mean, this is, that's just where my brain has taken me hearing this for the first time. Okay. So let's go into this other theory of that. He actually made it back to Calhoun. Okay. And the way that this theory works is like this was that Sean was that this trip was not like a super secretive trip that there were other people that would have had some general knowledge of what was going to go on, that they were going up there to sell drugs and Sean was coming back to Calhoun with a large sum of money with him. Okay. Now there, there have been people out there that have told me, look, we don't know whether or not that he actually made it back to Calhoun, but there is nothing really out there that would suggest otherwise. There's nothing out there that would make us believe that there wasn't a chance that he didn't make it back. You see what I mean? Meaning Mm -hmm. just because of where his truck was found, we know that the truck was found about five miles from the approximate distance of where he lost cell phone service. Mm -hmm. We do know that, but we don't know that it was found. You know, we don't know that it was in that spot five, 10 minutes after he lost cell phone service. We just know that it was found there four days later, or I'm sorry, nine days later, somebody had nine days to get that truck to that location if they wanted to. So there's people out there that, that have mentioned this rumor and this theory that Sean actually made it back. And at some point he was intercepted by go forth. Now go forth. The rumor is he enlisted his buddy, the help of his buddy who we will call cowboy. Well, hold on. We need to take a quick beer break. So we'll go back to go forth with his buddy cowboy right after this quick beer break. When a young girl disappears from rural Wind Gap, Missouri, reporter Camille Preaker is sent to investigate whether the case is linked to an unsolved murder. From the author of Gone Girl, the producer of Get Out, and the director of Big Little Lies comes the HBO limited series Sharp Objects. Sharp Objects is based on the best-selling novel by Gillian Flynn. Amy Adams stars as reporter Camille Preaker, whose proximity to the investigation, chilly mother, and mysterious half-sister bring her own scars to the surface. Hailed as a top-of-the-line detective story and truly twisted by variety, Sharp Objects is a must-see. Sharp Objects also features Patricia Clarkson, Chris Messina, and Eliza Scanlon. I watched the first episode and I am hooked. Check out Sharp Objects on HBO. Watch new episodes every Sunday at 9 p.m. and catch up on the latest episodes on HBO Now. That's Sharp Objects starring Amy Adams. Watch new episodes every Sunday at 9 p.m. on HBO and catch up on the latest episodes on HBO Now. Do you want to feel more well-rested every day? Well, then upgrade your nightly routine with Brooklinen. My Brooklinen sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've slept on. You can check out their website at brooklinen.com. They have a beautiful, easy-to-use website to help you shop for the best sheets. With versatile colors and patterns, you can mix and match Brooklinen sheets to complement any decor. And unlike most bedding that's marked up as much as 300%, 300%, that is crazy. There are no unnecessary markups and fees. This is luxury bedding under price. You have to try these sheets today. And like I said, my Brooklinen sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets that I have slept on. Brooklinen.com has an exclusive offer just for my listeners. Get $20 off and free shipping 
when you use promo code GARAGE at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so confident that they offer a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all of their sheets and comforters. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use promo code GARAGE at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code GARAGE. Brooklinen, these are the best sheets ever. Support for today's show comes from HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. They have three plans to choose from, including classic, veggie, and family. Each box is delivered right to your door in a recyclable, insulated packaging and is made up of fresh, responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and high-rated, trusted sources. Plus, with simple recipes outlined on pictured step-by-step instruction cards, you can feel confident in your cooking. There are even lots of one-pot recipes that require minimal cleanup. So you can spend less time meal planning and grocery shopping each week and get that time back to do more what you love. Here at The Garage, we love HelloFresh. I've tried the classic. I've tried the veggie. I've tried the family box. Love them all. And once you try HelloFresh, you're going to realize how much fun it is to do. So it's going to become a part of your life as HelloFresh has become a part of my life. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com slash Garage30 and enter the code Garage30. That's HelloFresh.com slash Garage30. Offer code Garage30 for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. All right, we're back. Time to go forth with this go forth in cowboy theory. Cheers, Captain. So the theory works like this. That at some point, Sean returns to Calhoun. There are people out there that suggest that there's nothing out there, no evidence to suggest that he didn't make it back to Calhoun. Mm-hmm. And when he arrives, he's intercepted by Goforth and Cowboy. Now, Cowboy is, is I shouldn't say rumored to be, um, there's many reports out there that this is a very violent individual. Mm-hmm. That he welcomes violence and is capable of possibly making somebody disappear. And this would be why Goforth would have enlisted his help in this situation that they had this guy that they wanted to take care of. So he brings in cowboy. Now, why is this a rumor? Well, there are many people in Calhoun. This is one of those stories. Okay. This is one of those cases, captain, where you go, I wonder where the evidence is. Because if, if this thing was investigated in the way that we were able to do this, just by talking to people, right? there's plenty of theories out there because there are plenty of people that have said, hey, I heard this, I heard that. There, you, you talk to somebody in Calhoun, they've heard something that means, you know, the result of what why Sean has disappeared. And right, we, but what we talked about earlier in the case is that sometimes law enforcement know what happened. They just can't prove it. Well, I think what the problem here is, is that there are several rumors out there and some of them point to some individuals being involved and some of them point to others, other individuals being involved. Mm-hmm. So the rumors regarding go forth and cowboy are that cowboy took Sean to a deserted drug house and there he shot him. And there are several stories as to what he did with Sean's body. One being that he was placed in the woods. Another that he was cut up and thrown in a creek. Another that he was buried. So under these situations, though, where we have further rumor to back up these stories, there would later be several women that would say that either go forth or cowboy or both at one time had shown them Sean's body. So we have the rumors of go forth and cowboy going around town, telling people that they've killed Sean jr. Mm -hmm. And then later we have women stating that not only did I, was I aware that they had killed him, but they showed me his body. Yeah. Well, that, that seems like uh, something I'd really want to take notice of. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like this is not just a rumor floating around town. Now we have rumors of, Women saying, I've seen his body. Correct. Correct. So here's the other weird thing. Now we have to throw this into the mix. 
There are several people that reported that the day after Sean disappeared, remember Stephanie, who was selling drugs. She was mm-hmm. maybe Sean's boss at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, that she was spotted with a large wad of cash on her the day after Sean went missing. This is very, this is very troublesome, right? Because we know that Sean, we believe Sean had a large amount of cash on him. Mm -hmm. There's lots of evidence to suggest this. So how did Stephanie get this money? Now she claims, well, she's a drug dealer too, but go ahead. No, I get that. I get that. Mm -hmm. But it's also the day after this individual goes missing. Mm Mm-hmm. She claims when asked about this money that she won it at a poker machine that she, that paid out cash. Mm-hmm. So she, that's how she acquired this large sum of money. Now here's where I think things are strange because we have this, we squashed the rumor that he was killed at the destination in North Carolina. Right. And, the, and Eric's the, family's place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or in the area of, right. And now we bring up this theory that maybe he made it all the way back to Calhoun. Mm-hmm. I here's here's my thoughts on this. I wonder if why can't it be somewhat both? Okay, could it be that Eric gets that they get to North Carolina? Mm-hmm. Sean leaves on the twenty first. How do we know that that was the plan? Any chance that the plan was, hey, I'm going to stay the night on the 21st. I'm going to wake up first thing in the morning, and then I'm going to I'm going to hit the ground running in the morning and make my way back to Calhoun. Right. And what I'm getting at with this is, is there a chance that several of these players are somewhat involved? That they may have different levels of involvement, mm-hmm. but they're all somehow involved in what ended up happening in the end. Meaning... Was Eric in conversation with people and saying, look, he's, he's trying to leave. I know we said that we were going to do this here because if you were going to set this up, if this was premeditated murder, and the reason why I'm kind of circling around the thought that there's foul play here and murder involved, one, when we covered, when you listen to the trailer of yesterday's show, that's a straight up report from law enforcement where they're stating that there were things found in their in this jurisdiction that led them to believe foul play was involved. Mm-hmm. They don't seem to believe that he just walked off on his own. So that's why we're circling around the thought that somebody murdered this individual. And I don't think that it's any coincidence that this guy is making this trip where he could make a bunch of money and he has all these known drug associates that probably knew mm-hmm. about this trip. They got the drugs from somebody that they ended up selling. That person probably knew about this trip. And then we have Stephanie, who, who, who's supposed to be the link between Eric and Sean Jr. So she may have known about the trip. We have Eric's cousin, Derek, who knows about the trip. So many people probably knew about this trip. And what I'm getting at is, if this is premeditated first-degree murder of Sean Jr., well, the most opportune time, my thought would be to get him while he's out of town. To get him when, he, when you know he's going to be up in North Carolina get rid of him there. And this is going to cause a bunch of confusion because the people that need to be investigated in the disappearance of Sean jr. All live and reside in Calhoun out of the jurisdiction of where the murder actually would have taken place. Now think Mm -hmm. about this. Let's say Eric's up there and Sean jr. Is hinting around like, Hey, I don't think I'm going to stay the night. I think I should probably just get back. It's close to Christmas time or now I got all this money. I'm itching to spend it or, or mm-hmm. get it back to my girlfriend or wife or whatever she is. Right. Mm-hmm. And then he starts communicating with these people and saying, look, I know you guys were going to come up here and get rid of him tonight or in the but, morning, but he's heading back. But now he's, he's saying he's going to leave. And guess what? I can't stop him from leaving. At some point he's going to leave. Mm-hmm. You guys need to get up here. And what I'm wondering about captain, is there a chance that is there a chance that he he was intended to be killed there in North Carolina? Sean Jr. intended to make it back to Calhoun, but the people that were going to kill him, they were en route or had to be en route sooner than they had planned, and then they're hoping to intercept him somewhere along the way. So in a sense, both theories are somewhat truthful, meaning that, one, that was the initial plan, and two... Hey, if we can't intercept him somewhere along mm-hmm. the way, we're going to have to get him once he gets back here to Calhoun. 
Yeah, and I didn't really like the whole idea of the when he gets back here, we're going to get him. Right. The reason why. It seems a little too loosey-goosey, doesn't it? Like yeah. like too many things could go wrong with that plan? No, I th- I think it's it's probably better. Look, at least um, go forth and Cowboy would be on their own turf. Right, so that would make a little more sense because you know the law enforcement, you know what the at least what the cop cars look like, right? Right. Um, you know, so that's one thing. But the thing that always kind of went well, that theory doesn't sit well with me was the convenience of where his car was parked or where the rented truck was parked in coordinates of the last place he was seen. The last place he's told his, you know, girlfriend he was seen. Yeah, he's making communication through his cell phone, and then he loses contact, and then the truck is found roughly what ten days later from the time he went missing, roughly in that spot around that area. Right. right. So, the, okay. So as you're telling me this stuff, that doesn't sit well. But then I start thinking, and I'm not. This is just hypothetically, but hypothetically. Did, you know, did she, was she a part of this, right? Right. Just, but, and I think that's less likely than Sean Jr. gets back with the money, possibly drugs, who knows, these guns, and we have Go Forth and Cowboy, and they take care of him, they kill him, and then they find out through rumors that he's missing, right? Right. And they know people that know people, and then they find out that he was on the phone, on the phone to his girlfriend, and he lost connection around this area, mm-hmm. right? Well, you just killed this guy. You have this rented truck. That's the biggest problem. Right. But now you know where he lost signal with his cell phone, and you're probably hearing some rumors around town. You, you would know exactly were to go drop off the truck right? to start pointing the fingers as other possibilities. Well, and that's interesting that you say that because I suspect that there, there may have been people in Calhoun that had an idea of where Sean was when he went missing, meaning they may be aware of that phone call that he had with Brandy King. Why? Because Brandy King was actively looking for Sean within the days after he disappeared. So how does that conversation go down when I'm, if I'm Brandy King and I'm talking to you and I say, Hey, look, I last spoke to Sean here. He Mm -hmm. said he was here and he left this gas station and, or I guess the thing that complicates that is Brandy King stating that it, it sounded to her that Sean didn't know where he was. So maybe that complicates that a little bit, but you could still have that conversation of saying, look, I was on the phone with him and we dropped service and I've not been able to talk to him since then. I've not been able to communicate with him since that occurred. So I think that I think for me, what seems to be the most plausible theory is that I think that these individuals that are involved or potentially involved with this, that they are street smart enough to know that if, if, if we need to get rid of Sean or if I need to get rid of Sean, I need for it to happen when he's out of town. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that creates a lot more possibilities than just me being involved. Right. It creates a lot more possibilities that maybe nobody even Calhoun was even involved because he, he went missing or was killed so far away from here. Then I think, guess what? When that plan is uprooted by him leaving early, now there has to be a new plan. And plan A is, can we intercept him on his way back? Mm -hmm. And if we cannot do that, then we're going to need Eric and maybe it requires the help of Stephanie. I don't know to set up another trip, maybe a month from now to North Carolina and give it a, a, another go at this whole thing. Mm -hmm. If that's your plan. And I think, unfortunately, unfortunately for Sean and for his family, personally, I think that I think he got intercepted on the way home. Well, wow. I, I think that 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 like you said and mm-hmm. like he said on the phone that he thought he was being followed. Mm-hmm. I think he he truly believed he was being followed and I think what happened was when he was on what was that 64 West mm-hmm. 
I think he sees this little Bernard Creek road that shoots off the side. And he thought, you know what? Whoever's following me, if I'm far enough away from them, let me pull onto this little country road and maybe I duck them. Right. And they keep going. Yeah. And go ahead. I was just going to say a little tip. If you ever feel like you're being followed, take, you know, four right turns or four left turns because you're going in a circle, obviously. And if by doing that, uh, you'll, you know, it would almost make zero sense for somebody to do that. Uh, those turns, you know what I mean? So if you're ever being followed, just a little tip for you. Well, if you're in a city or a town, go to a police department or a fire station. Right. Yeah. But, but Sean's out in the middle of nowhere. So he's going to have Mm -hmm. to improvise, let's say. Well, and he's a man. So we're, we're also not the brightest. The problem with him turning onto this Bernard Creek road is that it's actually a dead end road. Mm -hmm. Um, unbeknownst to him, he wouldn't have known that. However, I don't think that mattered at all because the vehicle was eventually located approximately a quarter mile up the road. So he never even, and it was, he would have been heading toward the dead end. So it doesn't appear that he made it to the dead end and tried to turn around. Mm -hmm. It looks like something happened before he could even realize this is a dead end road that either he thought he was being followed. I'll duck off on this country road and I'll in, and Hey, if I see the car coming or maybe I flee the vehicle, and get away from the vehicle. I think what happened was, I think he was intercepted on his way home to Calhoun, and I think something happened somewhat close to that truck. I don't know if he was abducted from there or if he was unfortunately killed there, but I think something happened close to that truck. Now, I... You you think we'd heard... I I think we would have heard more rumors about that. Well, yeah, and that's interesting because there are the rumors of people having seen the body or claiming to have seen the body, Mm -hmm. and then there's the the rumor of him being taken to a deserted house somewhere and being shot there. The deserted house doesn't bother me at all. Here's a couple things that bother me. First one, why are you there? Eric, that's suspect to me. Eric also says to his friend that he's going to kill him because he thinks that he stole $1,000. So... Suspect, right? Mm -hmm. Don't like it. Don't like the stopping to get batteries. That seems like it's purposeful of that day. Don't like it. What I also don't like is that he is telling his girlfriend, I'm being followed. Don't like that at all. Right? Mm -hmm. Where the the truck is found. Don't like that at all. But the thing that I don't like the most is these women coming forward. You know, coming forward saying, I saw his body. Yeah. That's the thing that, so out of all the things that don't make a lot of sense to me, that I feel like there's something more tangible there, that, out of all of them, just goes, well, that doesn't sit well. Yeah. So, i tell you what, though, Captain. Here's, here's, at the end of the day, what I think is, I hope this case does not go cold. Because I think this is a very solvable case. And what I mean by that is I think that there's enough rumor and there's enough stories that there's got to be enough people talking. Yeah, there's enough people talking, but there's got somewhere. If you sift through it enough, there's got to be some truth in there behind one of these stories or little hints of truth in, in, in several of the stories. And I think what can happen is I think that this could work itself out. I think that it could be solved. We're going to need some people to come forward. We're going to need some people to talk and we're going to need some, we might need some people to turn on one another Mm -hmm. because in my opinion, there might be a good chance that five, six, seven people know what happened Mm -hmm. that that, that they have maybe not firsthand knowledge, but they've been told exactly what has happened. We talked about this when we covered uh, Tara Grinstead's case. Right. We had an individual that had firsthand knowledge or knew a good amount of firsthand knowledge. And he tried to tell six, seven, a dozen people. Everybody just thought, oh, he's just, he's just joking. He's just for making ele- this up. For 11 years, basically confessed to seven to nine people. Yes. Right. And I'm hoping that at some point, at some time, the guilt in these people catches up with them and they start coming forward and telling the appropriate people. Tell law enforcement what happened, because I think there are many people out there that know what happened to Sean Jr. Now, I will say this. One thing that our investigation and looking into this case has turned up 
is we have been told that there is at least one individual out there that claims to have information regarding the where possible whereabouts of Sean Jr., of, of his remains, or maybe what had happened to him that is now willing to speak with law enforcement and was not before. Now, what information does this individual know? We don't know that exactly. But what we have been told is this information is being reported to law enforcement. Maybe this is the tip they need. Maybe this is the tip they need. Now, some other keys to possibly solving this case. Um, there is a rumor that, that his body, Sean's body, might be in the Sims Mountain area. Uh, and, and there's actually local rumor of a more specific location than just the Sims Mountain area. But I couldn't find anything in the newspapers or anything through the course of the investigation that suggests that that area has ever been searched. So it'd be nice to see if, if, if they think there's enough weight there in that rumor to search that area or that more specific area. The other thing is interview Goforth. Interview this individual that we've called Goforth because this individual's in prison now, just two years later. And the information I've been told is he's serving a life sentence. So if there's somebody, something that he knows, somebody that he could roll over on, mm -hmm. this would be the time to talk to him. I couldn't, nobody, everything that I've found and, and everybody that we spoke to, nobody could suggest that Goforth has been interviewed at any point or was willing to cooperate in the investigation. From the author of Gone Girl, the producer of Get Out, and the director of Big Little Lies comes the HBO limited series Sharp Objects. Amy Adams stars as Camille, a reporter who returns to her hometown to investigate the murders of two young girls. 